Well, I'm very pleased to have Nathaniel Jeanson join me this morning for this interview. And thank you, Nathaniel. And thank you. So go ahead and tell us, uh, what is your background, your education, and how you got started in this ministry? did my undergraduate in Wisconsin, uh, originally from Racine, born in Milwaukee. It's a dairy state, Cheeseheads, Fairweather Packer fan. <laughs> yeah. did my uh, undergraduate in molecular biology and bioinformatics at, at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. did three years of research there on molecular biology of photosynthesis, basically using single-celled algae. Got interested in cancer, so then I did, did my PhD at Harvard in cell and developed metal biology, and then joined ICR in 2009 as soon as I graduated, and am currently the Deputy Director for Life Sciences Research. I have from the book Evolution Shuffle Holes, uh, authored by myself and Frank Sherwin, a quote from Charles Darwin, famous quote, uh, kind of help us get started. So Charles Darwin wrote in his book on the origin of species, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not have possibly been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, then my theory would absolutely break down. So as you observe biology or microbiology, uh, can you provide any example or maybe a couple of examples that where if Darwin were alive today, where we could show him through observable science that his theory does indeed break down? We could show him numerous examples, whether or not he'd be persuaded is a, another question. But perhaps start at the very basics. For evolution to get going, it has to evolve the first cell, the first self-replicating molecule, basically DNA, RNA, protein. Even if you start with RNA, life is, by and large, the, the vast majority of life functions based on a DNA system. So DNA is transcribed or uh, sort of written down, if we, if we use a writing analogy, transcribed mm -hmm. into RNA. So if you were to write down what I was saying right now, you'd be transcribing it. And if you were to plug it into your computer and Google Translate and translate it into German, that's analogous for RNA to protein. And all three of these components are interdependent. You really can't read the DNA without the RNA, at least the cell can't. Mm -hmm. And even if you got just DNA and RNA, proteins involved in reading the DNA, they're all interdependent. You remove one component from the system, it basically breaks down. Okay, you have repeated that word. I wanted to emphasize it. It's completely different than independent. They are interdependent. In order to achieve uh, its operational ability, it has to all be working at the same time. That's right. And Mike Behe coined the term irreducible complexity to, to describe this phenomenon. It's sort of the, the trade secret of the evolutionary community for a number of reasons. There have been a number of responses to this. It's generated a lot of controversy, not surprisingly. And really four, four major responses have appeared, none of, the, none of which really address the question. So Darwin, of course, appealed to what he called artificial selection as a justification for the validity of natural selection to explain all that we see. But really, it's kind of a, a cheating analogy and doesn't address the, the test he laid out. Because what is artificial selection? It's intelligent human beings picking and choosing the varieties they want. And in evolution, there is no intelligence. So it's an interesting analogy, but it doesn't get at the question of how could natural processes without intelligence overcome this interdependence hurdle. It doesn't, it doesn't address that. How do people respond to, the, to these obvious problems with evolution? Basically, they ignore it and then say, well, we can really overcome it and, and sort of switch the topic. Uh, Darwin would switch the topic and say, well, look at artificial selection. Look what it can do. So it just doesn't seem like a big logical step to assume that natural processes could do the same thing. But it mm -hmm. is a huge logical step. How could natural selection substitute for human intelligence? It, it's really difficult to imagine. Obviously, some species survive, some don't, but how does that overcome uh, the hurdles that intelligence normally overcomes to, to make interdependent systems like DNA, RNA, and protein? Mm -hmm. Some might appeal to hierarchies, and leaving that analogy, uh, maybe, maybe it seems, I don't know the biology necessarily of birds and dinosaurs in great depth, but there's obviously huge physiological differences and if we examine the molecular biology of it, we might find very quickly an example of something that's impossible to involve, evolve by this mechanism Darwin proposed. And so what evolutionists will often do then is, is avoid the details and just say, well, we, can, we see a, a progress from simple to complex, let's say in the fossil record. Okay. Simple dinosaurs and complex birds, and, and we see these intermediates. None of that really addresses the question because Darwin said details are what matters. So it's not whether we can see simple to complex, it's can that simple organism be transformed 
step by tiny step into something more complex. Mm -hmm. So that avoids the question as well. Another thing they come up with, uh, and I've heard this because I've, I've given public lectures and groups of atheists and skeptics have come out and tried to protest and ask uh, pointed questions, and I've raised this argument. And one of them said, well, couldn't there have been a scaffold, a molecular scaffold, or maybe even a mineral scaffold that kept this part of the equation going, maybe, maybe kept DNA working without these other components while these were still evolving, or maybe, maybe we kept this aspect of reptilian physiology going while we're waiting, in a sense, for the, for the bird features to evolve. And that's a novel hypothesis uh, without a shred of evidence. And again, it's, it's really a bad analogy. Who creates scaffolds? So what is a scaffold? It's something you, you erect as you're building something uh, it's not part of the final structure. It supports the work on that structure. Mm -hmm. And you remove it when you're done. You never see a trace of it. Well, again, who does it? It's intelligent human engineers. We have no example of that really in nature. We do have proteins that are involved in multiple processes in the cell that aren't part of the final structure. But that's uh, just bumping the question back. We really, need to, really it's, a, it's an appeal to total speculation. Mm -hmm. Because what would be the evidence of a scaffold? You wouldn't see any because it... It's there during the process, then disappears. So it's, it's really hand-waving when someone says, well, maybe a molecular scaffold could overcome Darwin's. None of the, none of the appeals they've made to try to refute and, and deal with this example, when they, when they actually try to deal with it, solve the problem. So Darwin's test that he laid out 150 years ago is as valid today as it was back then. And in fact, because of the revolution of molecular biology and cell it's biology, far more valid. we've uh, discovered numerous examples mm -hmm. of where this applies, and really, that's where the answer will be. Where does where does change happen? It's at the DNA level, and so if you're going to find an irreducibly complex system, it's going to be in the DNA, and we've seen multiple examples of this already. Perfect, and I'd love to expand on that just a little bit. Let's talk about DNA some more. Uh, help people understand what DNA is, and um, Imagine what would need to take place for, in a, in a world where there is no life, there is no DNA, but through evolutionary, or it can't even be evolutionary actually, it's just by chance and, and chemicals, I guess, that you get these four nucleotides that come together to form their own language, to form their own um, communication system. What would, just describe that. What, to me, that just seems just so mind-boggling that, uh, again, it very much fulfills uh, Darwin's statement, uh, formed by numerous successive slight modifications. There, what would be the mechanism to, for these things to, to come together? Uh, go ahead. So here we're dealing with a really unique problem in evolution, abiogenesis, or life from non-life. And some evolutionists have pointed out, well, we can't really apply the test here per se because this assumes some sort of self-replication and this hasn't yet evolved. But nevertheless, Darwin laid out the test and so we're just taking him at his word. What's even more complicated here is we've got complex chemistry at play. So DNA is really just the stuff of inheritance. What makes us, give us, what gives us our eye color, hair color, height, so forth. It's what mom and dad pass on through egg and egg and sperm, and really mm -hmm. those contain DNA, and that's what makes you uh, anatomically and physiologically who you are. So how do we get this code evolved in the first place? So this, it controls not only our own anatomy and physiology, it controls trees. It's really the basis for nearly every life form out there. So how do we get this evolved in the first place? DNA has very special chemistry. Uh, it has sort of a handedness. You can't superimpose your left and right hand. They're mirror images of each other. And we have that sort of handedness, it's chirality, mm -hmm. chemical term, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in life. And there's really only one chiral form in, in, the, in the life forms that we see, the vast majority of them. Uh, but natural processes don't have a selective production of one hand or the other. Uh, natural processes produce 50-50 mixtures, and if you produce 50-50 mixtures, you're not going to evolve the life that we see today. So there's one problem. Uh, and of course, the chemical additions are a difficult problem. How do we get them to, to meet up in, in just the right order? Uh, and it's not just an order problem, it is a... Or even to find themselves yeah. or in a whole mass of other organic chemicals? Exactly. 
And even if you could solve all these difficult chemical problems, which we've just scratched the surface, you then have the problem, how do you start reproducing itself? Even if you just, through some completely random chance process, happened upon, you, you struck gold in the lottery, how are you going to get that thing to start reproducing itself and get evolution going? Again, you have, you have protein components, RNA components, you have all these other molecular structures that are involved in replication of DNA. So you've only taken one tiny step forward and you know we're close to uh, getting evolution going. One of the things I like to talk to um, the students about when we interact with them uh, near the campus at, in Madison is just the whole dilemma of making proteins that it requires a, a whole plethora of proteins in order to create a protein. So where could the first protein have come from with, without the existence of all these other proteins that are needed for the transcription factors, the polymerase, the, it's just mind-boggling to think that anybody who is that intelligent that's uh, in terms of uh, biology and, and chemistry that they're, they must understand this, but it's just completely illogical. It is a real chicken and egg problem, which evolutionists have tacitly admitted, which is what has led to this in vogue idea of the RNA world. There are some RNAs that can act as enzymes and, and multitask in a sense but that really doesn't solve the problem because again, life, by and large, is based on DNA is transcribed to RNA, made to protein, of course there are exceptions to this rule, but this is the fundamental, the central dogma, is what it's called, in biology. And even if you had some sort of multitasking molecule in the beginning, it's got to then transition to this interdependent system that has many of the components you mentioned, and that seems virtually impossible based on the standard that Darwin set. Of course, you could have some sort of miracle. Uh, here's one more exception that Darwinists have come up with to try to get around Darwin's problem. They'll talk about neutral evolution. So here's evolution apart from natural selection. Well, really, it's just a chance process. So here's where we apply probability calculations, simple probability calculations to the origin of the first DNA molecule, the first protein molecule, are just astronomical beyond the, even the, the, big, the Big Bang estimate of the origin of the universe. So I wouldn't agree with that date, but more than the atoms in the universe. It's just a mind-boggling probability. It's, it's impossible by any reasonable standard. Mm -hmm. So they really have no explanation, which is why I think people like Richard Dawkins have come out on public and said they think the first life was seeded here by aliens. It's just that hard to do. And so if we can push the problem off to another planet, maybe we won't have to think about it quite as much. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't solve the problem because you just apply all those same problems to that other planet. Mm -hmm. How did it get going there in the first place? Yeah. And no one really has an answer to that. But I would just like to say from a non-scientific point of view, <laughs> from that I think that there's a, maybe it's a misnomer that people will say, well, as long as there's a chance, you know, even no matter how, what the statistical data is and how many zeros there are behind the, the 10, um, as long as there's a chance it could have happened or maybe there was a miracle. But from my point of view as a non-scientist, I look at, the way some of these things would have had to take place or would have had to be informed, uh, whether it's the letters that didn't exist before that had to come together to create a code that didn't exist before without any, any intelligence guiding it, without any duplication or replication to create any kind of chance or, or uh, error, you know, in correction, none of that. And that's only just the beginning, whether it's the RNA world or DNA or the first protein and all the things that would take need to take place for a first protein to come about. It's just these machines that, are, that, that must happen. Uh, that it's just, it cannot happen. We're, not, we're talking about, from my point of view, you can't say it, I will. It's impossible. It is impossible. There is no possibility for this to happen. And an analogies may help. I, I read about one that was, I think, very insightful. Uh, there is a chance that all the oxygen atoms in this room can collect in a corner and we asphyxiate. But no one goes to bed at night wondering if they're going to be dead the next morning because all the oxygen atoms collect in the room. We can, there is a chance that a, a flat football uh, will inflate itself through collisions of molecules in the air, but none of the NFL referees stand around waiting for the footballs to inflate themselves. It's just, uh, it, it really exposes the hypocrisy. Again, we take for granted these 
basically impossible scenarios that have a chance of happening. But when it comes to something like evolution, all that intuition is cast aside and people cling to that's a chance, there is a chance, when uh, they disregard that sort of thinking in every other aspect of life. And it's really totally inconsistent. Nathaniel, it has been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much for uh, going through this and explaining these uh, details regarding origins, regarding biology and microbiology and what goes on inside the cell. I very, very much appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.